to have activities that everyone can do. And I do hope as well that you are all enjoying uh, using the blog. Tash and team, various people contributed to that. Um, and Lloyd and Lily have become cult heroes in the Cochrane household. So if you haven't seen Lloyd and Lily doing their exposition of Colossians, then please do because um, it's, it's huge. And today we're going to be looking at uh, three verses. So not going to be long, so don't worry. Um, really continuing our our kind of look through the book of Colossians and what it means to be anchored today in a bigger story. So I'm going to read this to you. Um, this is verse 21 to 23. So once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, that is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So please don't worry, by the way, the highlights are mine. It's not I've got a different Bible to you. But here's my question for you. And if you want to play along, I know experts get bored listening for too long. Here is a question I want you to answer. What's the best news you've ever received? Just think for a moment. Um, if you're next to your spouse, the, by the way, there are some right and wrong answers here that you can get into trouble with if you're not careful um there are all kinds of things that could be the answer to this but what is the best news you've ever received now looking out my window right now um i think if i asked charlotte what the best news she's ever received was looking out and seeing the snow that's happening outside for some of you it might have been uh the moment your better half or friend said i do or i will or maybe first jobs or first children or whatever it is but i guarantee that probably in our lives all of us have received news that we remember and in some ways it's a bit of a trick question because like most things the, the answers usually the preacher wants is the one that you weren't thinking about because I guarantee if we'd ask Paul the person who wrote this letter to the Colossian church what was the best news he'd ever received he would have been far more spiritual probably than my default answer was because what he would have said this he said the gospel is not just good news it is the good news. There has never been um, any better news for humanity. So if your answer wasn't the gospel, then you probably join me and many other people. But actually, when you come to think of it, when we listen to what Paul's saying, he's saying whatever other news you've received, and they're all good, there is only one the good news. And you know, to use that categorically, and what he's saying is the good news of the gospel is the biggest story of them all. And when we're grounded in that bigger story, then basically all of our life makes sense. And Paul um, is an incredible intellect, but if you think about it, his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus changed him in the most profound way. And the thing I love about him as well as a writer, he's far more concise than I am. I tend to talk far too much, as many of you will know. And Interestingly, in this passage today, I think Paul probably summarizes the gospel more concisely and more profoundly than perhaps anywhere else in the New Testament. And uh, therefore, when we look at it today, I hope it speaks to you as good news or reminds you of good news that maybe has got a little bit dulled over time. Because what he describes is, he says this, he says that we have a past condition a present position, a future promise, and what a persevering expectation. All in three verses, which is quite staggering, that you can capture the very essence of what the good news for humanity was in just three verses. So, you know, that's far more succinct than many of us. So let's have a look at these individually. Well, the first thing, and I'm just going to unshare my screen just for a second so I can see everything, forgive me. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, there we go. Now I can see everything. Can I actually now present again? There we go. So what he says here is our past condition wants you, and I put it in red because actually it was, yes, he's writing to the Colossian church, but he's also writing to you and I. He's saying once you were alienated from God. I mean, that's a pretty strong 
statement, isn't it? He says, you are actually enemies of God in your minds because of your evil behavior. Now, I don't know how you feel um, to hear that, but that seems quite strong language. We're not quite used to such perhaps absolute truth. But what he's saying here is we all have a past condition. And the reality is alienation, estrangement from God has led to hostility in our minds, evil deeds that causes us to become more alienated from God and each other. And I think if we're honest, we all know that reality ourselves is the more estranged from God we are, the more our behavior changes and we feel alienated from him and ourselves. But the good news, he says, is it's not just we have a past condition, that actually there is a present reality that will not change. He's saying he has reconciled you and me by Christ's physical body. And this is, the, this is the essence of that amazing word, to be reconciled, to be made one with, that in the midst of our rebellion, God chooses to intervene and basically deals with the cycle of sin and alienation in the way that we never could through the life, death, and physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we, he said, are now at one with the creator again because of what jesus did we can't do anything he's saying towards that but that actually that is our current position for those of us who've chosen to simply accept the gift of jesus we this morning are reconciled with him we are in relationship with him he offers us to be at one with him now that is staggering when you actually contemplate what does that mean for the God who made all things to be reconciled that you and I can be in relationship with him this morning. And not just reconciled for the present, but a promise that Jesus says is his goal is he reconciles us in order that on the day of judgment, when all of us will be called to account for the lives we've lived. In the end, it says Jesus will present us to the Father as holy faultless and blameless in his sight no accusation of the enemy will stand against us not because what we ourselves have done but because of what jesus has done and deposited into our accounts if that doesn't make you smile then you have what i call gospel fatigue because it's so easy sometimes to forget that perspective and then you know, a bit of a condition, Paul is always, um, there's always a little bit of sting in the tail, he said, but if you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith, not shifted, anchored, we might use in our current series, or grounded in our bigger story, and for many, this text has been often a little bit disconcerting, but as always, you need to read individual verses in the context of all of scripture, and what he's really trying to say is, if you continue, and I'm fully confident you will, Paul is exhorting the Colossian Christians, as he would be to us today, to keep on remembering the gospel, keep on exhorting us to live into that incredible present position and not to slip back into alienation through our sins so that we can be presented holy, mature and blameless. Now, I don't know. This is a this is a visual that I, I hope is helpful for you. For any of you who did sort of physics and had terrible times with it, I hope this doesn't bring back to terrible memories. But the question I often ask is the gospel is a lens through which we are encouraged to view all of our lives. But when challenges come, we are often tempted to insert another lens, which is not the same as the gospel. And one of the things I did was, and I'd encourage you maybe to have a go, is to look at what are the challenges that I'm currently looking at? Or what do I see people engaging with it? Well, I'm in lockdown. I'm frustrated. I feel slightly lonely. I feel isolated. I don't have all the relationships with you guys and others I would love. I kind of worry that I don't really want to get COVID. I'm worried for my parents. or I'm worried for some of you. And I know even today, people who are really ill, I, I worry about health, perhaps in a way I haven't. Uh, I also see in myself a a selfishness I kind of feel that in the kind of everyone retreats in and go oh am I going to be okay is my family going to be okay how do we provide 
I watch the tendency towards that or moral relativism, which is to go, hang on, well, you know, that the world looks now, is it really okay to have absolutes or questions around suffering perhaps where, you know, my usual Bible answers don't quite feel quite as robust as they do in normal life because we're dealing with a particular challenge. And when I look at the default lenses that many of us use, so some of you are, are really, really good with your feelings and you, you want to feel good. And so you look at the world through the lens of how you feel right now and you go like, well, I don't feel that good. I don't feel close to God. Or I don't feel close to other people. I feel isolated. Well, here's the thing, your feelings will lie. Your feelings are not the best lens to view the world. Some of us are thinkers. We're very rational. We're very ordered. We're very structured in the way we engage. And we're, we're tempted to try and solve the problems through the lens of our own rational intellect and others through the lens of culture, which is, you know, how do we interpret the science? But here's the thing. All of the lenses, and you may have others, they were the three common ones I observe in me and others. All of those actually create short-sightedness. We begin to view our problems in a myopic way and we miss the bigger picture. So here's the, here's the thing I want to offer to you this morning. There's something practical that actually what we need is not so much a lens. What we need is a prism. Because the gospel, Paul says, and the Bible teaches, is the lens through which everything finds its perspective. When we carry with us that consciousness of our past condition, our present position, our future hope, then what begins to happen is we begin to see the challenges of life through a far broader spectrum of color that nothing else can actually do. So when I look at my sense of loneliness and isolation, Jesus says, I will never be alone. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm closer to you today than you would ever know. Come and draw aside with me. When I'm worried about my health, he reminds me, the gospel says, this life is but a, a smoke dust in eternity, that one day we will look back on the years that we were on earth, how many of those were, through the lens of a lifetime with Jesus and others. When I look at my selfishness, she said, why do you worry? I've given you all things. Do you not worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear? Choose generosity because that's what Jesus has modeled for us. With your moral relativism, Paul would be adamant. There is only one way to the Father. There is only one good news. And that actually being anchored in that, we can appropriately engage with the challenges of our culture. And when it comes to our sense of the sickness and the challenge, do you know, it's okay that we don't have the answers for everything. The Bible is full of people wrestling with, why God, why did you allow this to happen to me, to the people I love? But ultimately he says, one day we will see in full what we see through glass dark dimly right now, that actually there is one who is just, who is fair, who will bring all things to a fair conclusion. And actually that is the bigger story. So the gospel summarizing three verses is unbelievable in its profoundness and its depth. But so often we miss, we miss that focus. So here are three questions that I want you to be able to ponder in your community groups today. I want you, particularly those of us who've been maybe followers of Jesus for a long time to ask this question, which is, what is my heart response, not my head response? What's my heart response to the challenge of the gospel? What is it the gospel fatigue needs to be realigned for me in the way I view the world? Maybe ask the questions, what's your default lens when you're struggling with some of the challenges? What is causes short-sightedness for you that loses sight of that bigger picture? And then ultimately, to be real and honest with each other and say, well, what are the challenges what are the things you're really struggling with right now? And what would it mean to look at those challenges through, the, through a prism called the gospel that actually, I believe, is the one place where we begin to see a bigger picture, that glorious, almost refraction of the light of the gospel, which shows us the place that we have in this world. So let me just pray before we finish. Father, I thank you that the gospel is not just good news, it is the good news. It is the news which transforms the history, 
and ultimately it transforms our lives. And Lord, today I pray that as we hear the challenge of Paul, as we watch the challenges in our own culture, that Lord, you would teach each of us to, to be reconnected to that good news. If it's the first time we've heard it, Lord, let it move us to the core of our being. If we've heard it many times before, would you renew that sense of amazement that while we were far off, you intervened to reconcile us to yourself through the life, death and resurrection of your son that we may be one with you now and that one day as we stand before the judgment seat, Jesus himself will present each one of us holy, blameless and free from accusation. 